This is my video update on this Friday, January 12th. Let's talk about some news. And we have got a lot of news to get to. So we do have some big news in Yemen. And let's, uh, let's work our way up to the big news in Yemen because before the US and the UK launched strikes in Yemen we had Iran seizing a tanker taking back an oil tanker that the US had seized from Iran a few months back now I think that I talked about this story I want to say four to six months ago when I was in Athens, Greece. And at the time, the Greek government, they had seized a total of, on the U.S.'s orders, or orders, they had seized a total of two tankers, I believe. No, one tanker, one oil tanker. And then Iran, in retaliation, they seized two Greek ships, though I'm not certain if those were oil tankers or, or what those ships were, but I remember this story. And, uh, and then it just kind of went away. The story just kind of disappeared, or at least I didn't follow up on this story. But uh, that's what happened between Greece and Iran and the U.S. telling Greece to seize this... Uh, this Iranian uh, tanker and take its oil. And, uh, and now it looks like we have a continuation to that story because this ship was, was being managed by a Greek shipping company. The name of the ship was the St. Nicholas, but it was previously called the Suez, the Suez Sajana, I want to say forgot the name of of what this ship used to be called but it was but currently it's called the uh the saint nicholas the suez sajana i think i got that one right <laughs> anyway so uh look uh iran decided to take this oil oil tanker back <laughs> long story short iran decided to uh to seize this tanker of course the the neocons, the United States, they completely flipped out. Now, this happened yesterday before the U.S. and the U.K. launched missile strikes against Yemen. Here is the article title from Al Jazeera. Iran seizes oil tanker off Oman in dispute with the U.S. State-run IRNA news agency published a story acknowledging the seizure of an oil tanker by Iran's navy. Iran seized a tanker with Iraqi crew destined for Turkey in retaliation for the confiscation last year of the same vessel and its oil by the, by the United States. Iran state media reported a move likely to stoke regional tensions. The Navy of the Islamic Republic of Iran seized an American oil tanker in the waters of the Gulf of Oman in accordance with a court order, the state-run IRNA news agency said. After the theft of Iranian oil by the United States last year, St. Nicholas tanker was seized by Iran's Navy, the Navy said, as cited by the Iranian news agency Fars. The U.S. condemned what it called an unlawful seizure and, dem and demanded Iran immediately release the ship and its crew. So, yeah, this might have been a year ago. I'm thinking four to six months ago. My God, time really, really goes by, doesn't it? This was about a year ago in Athens when this story broke, when this... Greek, Iranian, U.S. oil tank uh, seizures started to, to take place. So, uh, yeah, the St. Nicholas has been taken back by Iran. The Collective West is saying that Iran stole this oil tanker, uh, with all its oil, by the way. And uh, this preceded the big U.S.-U.K. Uh, missile strike towards Yemen. 
my feeling on this oil tanker situation is that this was the the final uh, straw for the neocons to get Biden to green light the, the Biden White House, to green light an attack against Yem Yemen with the ultimate goal, of course, being to hit Iran, to get a wider regional war with Iran. Because everyone knows that strikes against Yemen, especially the type of strikes that they launched yesterday against Yemen, is not going to do anything to, to Yemen or the Houthis. They've been at war for many, many years now with Saudi Arabia, the U.S. backing, backing Saudi Arabia. And so for them, this strike is, is not going to deter them whatsoever from what they're doing uh, in the Red Sea. And actually, Yemen, the Houthis even said as much. They released a statement saying, you know, tis but a scratch. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, go ahead. This doesn't stop us. This is not going to prevent us from, from uh, stopping ships from passing through the Red Sea. And, and we're heading towards escalation now. That's, that looks like this is the only path forward. Because look, everything that happened yesterday is exactly what the neocons have been pushing for. And there are some analysts who believe this may be a one-off. This may be a limited strike against Yemen. And that's going to be it. The U.S. has shown its, its power and uh, the Houthis are going to stop and that'll be that. But that's not what's going to happen. The, uh, the Houthis and Yemen, they're going to continue to prevent ships from going through the Red Sea. The U.S. is going to be compelled along with the neocons. They're going to feel like they're, they're going to have to uh, continue to strike out at Yemen. Of course, the neocons, they want this to widen out towards Iran. And uh, that's the trajectory of things. And uh, in the Biden White House, they can't lose face. Can you imagine how embarrassing it would be for the Biden White House if uh, after this strike, the Houthis continue to, to uh, take over cargo ships or, or hit at ships crossing through the Red Sea, continue to block the Red Sea, and the Biden White House does nothing? Can you imagine how embarrassing that's going to be for the Biden White House? Impossible. The next ship that Yemen, that the Houthis uh, go after in the Red Sea, the Biden White House is going to have to escalate in Yemen. And this is the path of things. Once again, the neocons, the neocons, they got their eye on the prize. And that prize is, is Iran. They want to draw Iran into this. Anyway, this is what uh, Politico said. Uh, U.S. attacks Houthis. Houthi targets in Yemen in response to missile barrages in the Red Sea, breaking the U.S. and U.K. with support from Australia, the Netherlands, Bahrain, and Canada conducted joint strikes tonight against Houthi targets in Yemen per DOD official. Strikes involved U.S. aircraft, ships, and submarines. That's the, that's the coalition of the willing. The U.S., U.K., along with support from Australia, Netherlands, Bahrain, and Canada. Let's see, U.S. Central, uh, Central Command put out this Twitter X post on January 11th at 2.30 a.m. Sana'a time, U.S. Central Command forces in coordination with the United Kingdom and support from Australia, Canada, Netherlands, Bahrain conducted joint strikes on Houthi targets to degrade their capability to continue their illegal and reckless attacks on U.S. and international vessels, the commercial shipping in the Red Sea, and commercial ship shipping in the Red Sea, the multinational action targeted radar systems, air defense systems, and storage and launch sites for one-way attack unmanned aerial systems, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Here is the statement from U.S. President Joe Biden, who, as per Dr. Jill Biden, wakes up every morning and works hard for the American people. Here is the statement from President Joe Biden on coalition strikes in Houthi-controlled areas in Yemen. Today, at my direction, U.S. military forces, together with the United Kingdom, and with support from da 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 da, -da <laughs> successfully conducted strikes against a number of targets in Yemen used by Houthi rebels to endanger freedom of navigation in one of the world's most vital waterways. So that's from the Biden White House. Now, CNN, they ran an article with the title, U.S. and U.K. carry out strikes against
against Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen. Now, the interesting part about this CNN article is that way down in the article, CNN says that Lloyd Austin coordinated the whole thing from his hospital bed. Not a joke. <laughs> Not a joke. Lloyd Austin in hospital, recovering from prostate cancer treatment or surgery. He conducted and coordinated, commanded this entire uh, operation. From Zlati 71, the U.S. Air Force said it fired more than 100 cruise missiles at 16 sites in Yemen and hit 60 plus targets at those sites, as per ISZ reports. And how about this title from AP? Conditioning the Collective West, manufacturing con consent for the population of the Collective West to uh, go to war with Iran. U.S. British militaries launch massive retaliatory strike against Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen. Against Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen. Retaliatory strikes. That's the article from the Associated Press. It is all about Iran and Lindsey Graham, a chief high priest, a neocon, he is creaming in his pants about the prospect of going to war with Iran, not thinking about, about the future of this conflict and how this conflict can, uh, can bog the U.S. and the U.K. down and can be very catastrophic for the Biden White House and for the U.K. The neocons never think about that stuff not to mention the price of oil and, and the implications on the global economy, inflation and all that stuff. By the way, the price of oil, if it goes up, once it goes up, we all know uh, what country benefits from, from that. A bug just landed on my sunglasses. <laughs> um, Lindsey Graham, here is what he posted. Lindsey Graham is absolutely just, he is enthusiastic, intoxicated, absolutely intoxicated. Here's what Lindsey Graham posted. Very supportive of the Biden administration's decision to strike Houthi rebels who have been harassing international shipping and trying to attack Israeli and American interests. It's long past time to let Iran know that we will hold them accountable for the actions of their proxies, in this case, the Houthi rebels. The only language radical Islamic groups understand is force. I hope the Biden administration understands that their deterrence policy has completely failed. They must continue using military force in the face of aggression from Iran and their proxies. It is all about Iran. All about Iran. The reports are that Saudi Arabia actually gave the okay for their, their airspace to be used in these attacks against Yemen. The, the kingdom, according to, to ISZ reports, the kingdom is following with great concern military operations in the Red Sea region and raids on targets in Yemen. We emphasize the importance of maintaining security and stability in the Red Sea region and call for restraint and avoidance of escalation. Well, it might be too late for that, MBS in Saudi Arabia. Look, Saudi Arabia was at war for so many years uh, with Yemen. So uh, yeah, it looks like Blinken when he was in Saudi Arabia uh, it looks like he was lobbying for the, the opening of Saudi airspace in order to launch these strikes against Yemen. Of course, MBS, he has come out in many statements saying that he wants to avoid a war against Iran because uh, Saudi Arabia, and this was from a New York Times uh, article, because Saudi Arabia, well, they're trying to, to become the next uh, Dubai. Riyadh is trying to to attract investment and tourism, and it's trying to follow the model of the UAE and Dubai. So that is, uh, that is the news from Saudi Arabia. So look, uh, I hope this is a one-off. I hope this is limited, but I just don't see how that can happen. I really don't see how that can, uh, how that can be. Because the Houthis, actually, here's a statement from Houthi leadership. The Houthis are not gonna back down. Yemen's not gonna back down. The battle will exceed the imagination and expectations of the American and British. You know, um, I don't know. I'm, I've got a, a, a suspicion 
that uh, this is exactly what, what the Houthis were aiming for. Iran, the Houthis, I don't know. Um, maybe Russia, maybe China, I have no idea. But, you know, it, it feels like, like the U.S. and the U.K. have fallen into a trap. The neocons are, are ecstatic, but the neocons are never strategic. They're just war, war, war. Right now, today, war, bomb, war, missiles, strike, war. That's the neocons. They never think uh, one year in the future. They never think three months in the future. And it just feels like, like the U.S. is and the U.K., they're heading into a trap. A lot of U.S., a lot of U.K. ships are going to be operating in the area. This thing's going to escalate, most likely. I hope it doesn't. I hope I'm wrong. But, um, you know, look, as I said five minutes ago, uh, once the Houthis, once Yemen uh, strikes another ship crossing the Red Sea, the Biden White House is boxed in. They're going to have to uh, attack Yemen again. There's, there's going to be no other option. And you heard Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, he can taste the blood now. He's like, continue to strike. Continue. Don't stop. Wow, very windy. Let's go back up there. Whew. Super windy. So let's, uh, yeah, the U.S. getting bogged down. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about the, the other catastrophe for the Biden White House, which is Project Ukraine and trying to destroy Russia and balkanize Russia. And, uh, you know, I started off this video saying that, that what I believe, I believe the spark to, to the strikes in Yemen was the tanker being seized by uh, by Iran being taken back? To be quite honest, we have to we have to be honest about this. Uh, that that seems to be what uh, sparked all of this off. But um, you know, the Biden White House. Since we're talking about seizing property, the Biden White House has uh, has submitted a bill to Congress, or they're preparing a bill to Congress, so that they can get the okay get everyone on board to uh, push for the seizure of the 300 billion in Russian frozen assets. 200 billion, roughly 200 billion, allegedly is in Europe with the EU. Another 100 billion is with the United States. And Biden, he is looking for Congress is approval. According to Bloomberg, White House throws support behind seizing frozen Russian assets. Funds frozen amid Ukraine war could be used for reconstruction. Yeah, right. Biden seeks to rally Republican support stay aligned with the G7. So in this article from Bloomberg, they say that uh, the EU is still uncertain uh, about seizing these, these assets. The EU understands that if they seize these 200 billion in Russian frozen assets being held in Belgium, then that's the end of the EU economy. Any, any trust in the EU financial system is completely demolished. Same goes for the United States. The same goes for the U.S., but I imagine the Biden White House probably feels like they can, they can absorb the, the damage that's going to come, but I don't think so. This is, this is the nuclear option. This is the economic nuclear option in this proxy war with uh, Russia. The Biden administration backs, in principle, a bill that would provide the authority needed for the executive branch to seize Russian sovereign assets for benefit of Ukraine. Some, some 300 billion in Russian funds remain frozen in the West, more than 200 billion of which is held by the EU and the rest by the US. The shift in the White House's stance on the matter comes as Republican lawmakers continue to resist attempts by the Biden administration to push through another 60 billion in military support for Kiev. Bloomberg said the EU's 50 billion Aid package for Ukraine also remains stalled due to a veto by Hungary. Biden has been warned by everybody. I'm not going to go over this again. He's been warned by everybody. Do not do this. You're going to destroy the trust of the U.S. financial system. You're going to destroy everything in and around the U.S. financial system and the U.S. dollar. Don't do this, Biden. Europe. Europe's going to be toast. That's a given. They're already toast, but, but they'll be even more toast. <laughs> but uh, the United States, man, Biden has gotten the warning. Don't do this. But, you know, 
Uh, Kirby came out with, uh, with a statement to the media yesterday, and he said that we've given everything we can to Ukraine, the last uh, military aid and money, we've given it to Ukraine. And he's like, look, Congress has to approve the $61 billion. That's simple. Congress has to approve the $61 billion. So, you know, uh, <laughs> the Biden White House, this could be, this could be some sort of bluff by the Biden White House, though I don't think they're, they're, they're smart enough to, to come up with this type of bluff. But maybe, just maybe, the Biden White House and the, the wonder, the wonder kid, Jake Sullivan and, and Anthony Blinken, maybe, maybe they're saying, you know what, we'll, we'll really push the envelope here. We'll threaten the, the seizure of Russian assets. We'll really spook the crap out of out of the EU, out of Congress, out of Wall Street, out of the IMF, out of the Treasury, that uh, we're going to go through with taking this $300 billion so that Congress could say, okay, take the $61 billion, don't touch the $300 billion because we don't want to nuke our financial system. Maybe this could be a bluff, but I seriously doubt it. I think this is just more about power and greed and jealousy. <laughs> they are... They are upset, they're jealous of Putin, they're jealous of Russia, they're upset that they're getting their butt kicked by, uh, by Russia, and, uh, and they're lashing out, man. They are lashing out to the point where they're ready to destroy their own, uh, their own economy in order to try and stick it to Russia. And we all know that Russia's going to retaliate. They said that they'll probably seize uh, assets from the West that are in Russia, but you know what? Russia can retaliate in a thousand other ways. I'll say, I'll say this again <laughs> because I think this is interesting. We now have a very interesting dynamic that might, that might play out. Uh, you know, U.S. and U.K. warships now are going to be operating in the, in the Red Sea, in the region. You know, there's a thousand ways for, for Russia to, uh, to retaliate. I'm not saying they're going to do anything there, but, you know, the, the UK, they've been, they've been pushing this proxy war really hard. Well, uh, Russia can, can push a proxy war through Yemen. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I'm just, you know, this could be a scenario that, that could play out. So, so that's the situation. Biden, he's gonna, he's gonna take that 300 billion. He is going to take that 300 billion and you wanna know what's gonna happen with that 300 billion? It's gonna disappear. I've read analysis which says, you know, if he gets that 300 billion to Ukraine, then that can fund Ukraine for 10 years. They can fight the Russians for 10 years. What a bunch of bollocks. Bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to like that word. <laughs> Um, no, 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 no. The 300 billion is going to get lost. We all know it is going to get lost. It's going to get washed. It's going to get, uh, get stolen. It's going to get, uh, it's, it's going to buy football clubs in the UK in five, 10 years. That's what that 300 billion is going to be used for. Yeah, there'll be a percentage that actually goes to Ukraine, but, um, it won't be, it won't be more than 25%, and I, I'm being generous. I'm being very, very generous here. Case in point, Alensky, he's uh, touring the Baltics, and yesterday he was in Estonia, and he said, I am very grateful to President Biden, but more than 70% of the money for Ukraine remained in the United States. Speaking to the Baltic media, the leader of Kiev, of the Kiev regime said that he was not pressing for pity, but where is Biden's money? Without Western funding, the 51st U.S. state will not be able to pay pensions. That's a tweet from Sprinter. Um, he did say, where is, where is Biden's money? <laughs> where is Biden's money? 70% of everything the U.S. promised to, uh, to Ukraine, it went to the military industrial complex, 10% for the big guy, MIC, BlackRock, uh, Wall Street, the bankers. We all know where all this money goes. And, and then the 30% that goes to Ukraine, how much of it do you actually think goes to the people of Ukraine? 
of that 30%. Because Oletsky has to get his cut, and Podoliak, and Budanov, and uh, Zaluzhny, and everyone has to get their cut, and the, and the parliament members have to get their big, huge salaries that the U.S. pays for, and how much of this money, this 30% that Oletsky says is actually going to Ukraine, is actually going to the well-being of the people of Ukraine. Not much, not much at all. The New York Times actually ran an article the other day with the title, U.S. military aid to Ukraine was poorly tracked, Pentagon report says. The report found that American officials and, dipl and diplomats had failed to quickly or fully account for all of the nearly 40,000 weapons sent to the front. That's the New York Times basically saying we have no idea where the, where the weapons are really going. And now, uh, Elensky, he's, he's begging the Baltic nations for air defense systems. That's what he's actually asking for. Air defense systems. An admission that uh, Ukraine's air defense, air defense systems are on the, on the brink of complete collapse. So in uh, Poland, there's all kinds of stuff going down in Poland. Donald Tusk, Donald Tusk, quite the, quite the authoritarian, that Donald Tusk. So uh, last week, week and a half ago, I talked about how Tusk is shutting down media companies that he believes are uh, loyal to the Law and Justice Party, and he's firing personnel. And the other day, he went after two former ministers of the law and justice from like 2000, 2008, 2009. Now, I might get the story wrong. So people watching in Poland, please forgive me if I mess up this story because I'm sure I'm going to mess it up a bit. But I think I'm going to get the general uh, summary of, of what's happening correct. These two ministers way back... They, uh, they were charged with some, some corruption, some scandal corruption. And the, the Supreme Court in Poland at the time found them guilty. But then uh, law and justice, they pardoned these two ministers. And a new Supreme Court from what I understand, the Supreme Court that they put in place or a court that they put in place upheld the pardon. So these guys were free and clear. And now Donald Tusk, who came in second, his party came in second in the election, but miraculously he was able to form a coalition and become the leader of Poland. He, uh, he's going after these two guys. And so these two ministers... They actually went to the, I want to say the offices or the residence of Duda, the president of Poland, who is very much aligned with law and justice. And they sought refuge and protection from Duda, and Duda gave them protection. And then the police of Tusk, they stormed this building, this presidential uh, office or residence, and uh, they arrested these two ministers. Euronews says one of two politicians arrested in Poland goes on hunger strike. Polish police on Tuesday arrested two politicians convicted of abuse of power in a dramatic escalation of a standoff between the new and previous governments. So the one guy is now going on a hunger strike. He, he claims his innocence. So this is Poland. This is what's happening in Poland. You know, uh, Tusk, this is expected from Tusk. The guy is an EU loyalist, authoritarian, globalist, neo-lib. That's Tusk, man. That is Tusk. I mean, he was, he was uh, EU council president. He had uh, Michelle's position, the position that Michelle is resigning from. That's Tusk. That is Tusk. So he's going to do what is in the best interests of the EU and the globalist elite neo-libs. That is what Tusk is going to do, and that means that he has to cancel and wipe out all of his opposition, because that's how democracy works in the collective West. Democracy in the collective West is no opposition to our uh, ideology and policy. 
That is collective West democracy. <laughs> yeah, so that's what Tusk is doing now. And then there was a protest yesterday in Poland. Uh, tens of thousands of people got out onto the streets who are in support of law and justice. And uh, it's very much a country that's, that's divided because there is a lot of support for Tusk and there is a lot of support for the European Union. But on the flip side, there's also a lot of support for law and justice. Law and justice was actually in first place after the election. The party came out in first place. They just couldn't form a coalition. And so they couldn't govern. And, and you know, I wish I could, I could sympathize with law and justice, but you know, you, you made your bed, you now have to lie in it. Law and justice, right? Because you went hard with Project Ukraine and Destroy Russia. You really bought into that, and uh, you ended up losing your power and, and putting Poland in the position that it's in right now with Tusk as prime minister, with essentially the EU, the EU firmly in control of Poland now, firmly in control of Poland, because law and justice, before the conflict in Ukraine broke out, law and justice were, they were like aligned with, with Orban. Actually, Hungary and, uh, and Poland, they were like, Simpatico, you know, they were a team and uh, And the EU hated that the EU hated law and justice just like they hated Orban and And, and, and Fidesz and, and Hungary so the war uh, Breaks out the conflict the special military operation and what Poland should have done what law and justice sh Justice should have done is they should have kept aligned with Orban and Hungary throughout the entire SMO they should have uh, followed Orban's lead. But instead, they cozied up to the EU. They cozied up to the Biden White House. They went hard against Russia. They went hard with uh, Project Ukraine. And once the elections came around, the EU said, Tusk, Tusk is, Tusk is our guy. Thank you, Morawiecki. Thank you, Kaczynski. Thank you, Law and Justice, for all the support with Project Ukraine. But now you guys got to go because you're not 100% committed to the EU ideology and the EU religion. So anyway, <laughs> I think I got that story right. Let's uh, do a clown world now and we will wrap this video up. A huge news day. Huge news day this Friday. So we have got some good clown worlds. I think this photo of Alensky in this in this dusty car. <laughs> I think this is from Estonia. Either this is him driving around Estonia or driving around Lithuania. But take a look at the, the photo of Alensky in the back seat of this car with his headphones on. The drivers, I guess the drivers didn't give him a, a booster seat. But <laughs> Alensky, man, Alensky, he does not look happy at all. I wonder what song he's listening to. Uh, Taylor Swift is very good. I really like Taylor Swift. She's my favorite. Maybe one day I will see her concert. I hear it's very popular. Taylor Swift. <laughs> He's listening to Taylor Swift, I'm telling you. <laughs> she beat me for time, person of the year. But she deserved it. <laughs> oh, man. So that's Alecki. <laughs> In the back seat of the car. Looking very, very upset. I have to admit, it does not look good, Oletsky. So, uh, <laughs> Oletsky. Oletsky's got a, got a clown world double header with Oletsky. So he meets uh, Kaya Kalis and check out this photo. He meets the Estonian prime minister. <laughs> and the Estonian prime minister hugs Oletsky. <laughs> now, I might be wrong about this. But this is the first time I've seen uh, a female, a woman, uh, EU leader, a Collective West leader, hug Alensky. I think this is the first time that this has happened. Usually it's always, it's always the, the males, the men, you know? Usually it's, it's Trudeau and Macron, and it used to be Duda before they had a falling out. Duda, boy, did Duda love to hug Alensky. <laughs> Those guys, they were hugging Alensky. Um, Boris Johnson. Rishi Sunak, I mean, they cannot keep their hands off Alensky. And whenever he would, like, meet the, the women leaders of the Collective West, they would just shake hands. He would keep his distance and shake hands. But in this photo, man, Kaya Kalis is, like, all over him. 
bro. <laughs> they are really hugging it out. So I, I know what's going on here. I know exactly what is going on, everybody. Elensky number five for women. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Elensky had a nice, uh, a nice cologne for, uh, for men. And now he has a nice cologne perfume for women. <laughs> Elensky number five. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you want your man or your woman to find you irresistible? Do you want them to hug you nonstop? Well then buy Ilensky number five. <laughs> uh, your partner, your partner will not be able to keep their hands off you. And they will give you lots of money too. <laughs> Elensky number five. Yeah, it's that, it's that cologne, man. <laughs> it's that cologne. Yeah. So that's Elensky meeting Kaya Kalis. In my final clown world, we go to France. And is this true? Is this story true, everybody? Because I'm having a hard time believing this one. I'm having a really hard time believing this one. The new Prime Minister of France, Mr. Gabriel Attal, 30, 34, 35 year old Prime Minister of France, he appointed a new foreign minister. And that foreign minister is his husband partner. That is the new foreign minister of France. That's not right. That's not right. If you're the prime minister, you should not be appointing your husband, your partner, your wife, your mistress, whatever. That should not be the person that you appoint as foreign minister, as defense minister, as treasury minister. This is wrong in so many ways. You just don't do these things. So, you know, this guy is, is young and he has already made a huge mistake, a huge blunder already with this appointment. You're telling me there's no one else in France that he could have appointed as foreign minister? No one? You had to appoint your, your husband partner as foreign minister? The optics of that are, it's just terrible. Absolutely terrible. And the collective West, they're going to lecture other countries about, about how their governments are structured? Really? Is that what we're going to see Atal uh, do? Lecture, lecture Russia about, about corruption and cronyism and nepotism and all of that stuff? No, thank you. Anyway, that's the video, everybody. The Durant.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Durant shop. 15% off on all merch. I'm very curious to see how the audio comes out on this video because, wow, is it a windy day. Take care, everybody.